Hi, my name is Tony Santo and I'm a large format photographer. This video is all about Fujifilm Velvia and everything I've learned about shooting the film since 2009. I first learned about Fujifilm Velvia from my good friend Ken Rockwell on his website KenRockwell.com. He's got a lot of great examples that show the vivid and saturated colors that you can expect out of this type of film. However, one of the things that wasn't apparent to me at the time was just how tricky and challenging this film could be to use, at least to get consistent and reproducible results. So what I've done in this video is I've put together four points that I think are really important to have a good baseline understanding if you're thinking about shooting this film. So I'm going to cover the latitude of the film and what you can expect as far as the dynamic range of a scene. I'm going to cover the different lighting conditions that I've shot the film under and I'll show you lots of examples of what to expect and the kinds of images that you can expect given certain lighting conditions. I'll show you also how I meter a scene and how I take into account reciprocity failure. I'll also show you how I store the film for both the short term and in the long term. So let's take a look. To understand the latitude that Fujifilm Velvia has in recording light, let's first define a few terms. Exposure is the absolute or maximum quantity of light that reaches the film plane or digital sensor. The exposure is controlled by manipulating the combination of aperture or f-stop, shutter speed, and the choice of ISO. Photographers typically talk about manipulating exposure in terms of stops. A stop of light is simply a relative or given quantity of light that contributes to the exposure. Each increase in the stop of light doubles the relative quantity of light, while each decrease in the stop of light will half the relative quantity of light. To put it simply, if the exposure is darker than desired, increasing the quantity of light by one stop will brighten the image. Conversely, if the exposure is lighter than desired, decreasing the quantity of light by one stop will darken the image. Ansel Adams designed what he called the zone system, which basically divides the quantity of light into 10 stops or zones of light. As we move towards zone 0, less light is captured, and as we move towards zone 10, more light is captured. This translates into zone 0 being pure black with no detail visible, and zone 10 being pure white with no detail visible. Zone 5 is considered middle gray and is what all handheld and built-in light meters are calibrated for. So, if you had your camera set to automatic exposure control, the meter will measure all the light in the scene and average the exposure to read 18% middle gray or zone 5. This represents an exposure that ideally gives you the full dynamic range of zones 1 through 9 with detail across this spectrum of light. Realistically, however, Adams discusses that more often than not, texture or details will only be seen from zones 2 to 8 for a total of 7 stops of light. So what about Fujifilm Velvia? Well, as far as Fujifilm Velvia is concerned, the range with which we are able to record texture or detail in both the shadow and light areas of the image decreases to just 5 stops of light. In other words, light can only be recorded effectively from zones 3 to 7. So, if the scene we are metering in terms of contrast is greater than 5 stops, that is, if the difference between dark and light areas exceeds 5 stops, we will lose detail in either light or dark areas of the image. This is why exposure must be set as close as possible to zone 5 for most scenes. Deviations in the stops of light away from zone 5 as far as exposure goes will result in a loss of detail under most shooting conditions. In addition, Felvia is a high contrast film that will exaggerate high contrast scenes, which can be very frustrating as I learned early on. Let's take a look at some examples of images I've taken over the years that illustrate the lack of the film's latitude. Before I show you some examples of Fujifilm Velvia's latitude, I'd like to briefly take a moment to list the shooting parameters of these images. 
All of the images were taken during my wife and I's first year wedding anniversary trip to the Wild West when we were living in North Carolina at that time. This is significant because it was the same year in which I began shooting large format. I didn't have a handheld light meter, so I used my original Canon 5D as a light meter to achieve Zone 5. The images progressed from morning light to evening light, and I used absolutely no filters uh, because I simply didn't own any at the time. The 4x5 images were digitized using my Epson V700 scanner, and finally, you get to see all of the digital versions of the trip uh, as well for a comparison of the dynamic range. This first image is actually not that bad, and I do kind of like it. However, it does demonstrate the challenge of shooting this type of film. I like how the sky is nicely exposed with great color, as well as the sign itself. Once you get into the foreground and palm tree branches, you begin to see how those areas lose detail because of the film's latitude. For this particular scene, you could make the argument that it conveys a certain mood. Next up is a sunrise shot from Zion National Park, where I naively thought that I would capture detail in both the nicely lit mountains and in the shaded foreground at the same time. That obviously didn't happen since it is a high contrast scene despite being metered for zone 5. This image is from Bryce Canyon National Park on a very cold morning with incredible fog hovering in the lowlands. I've been back many times and I'm yet to see a sunrise match the beauty of the one we saw on this particular day. Anyhow, this is a high contrast scene exposed for zone 5 that demonstrates loss of detail and color saturation in the sky. The foreground could also use about a stop increase of light as well. A graduated neutral density filter will definitely help as I've since gone back and tried one out on this scene several times. Nonetheless, this image actually provided a good base for manipulation in Photoshop and turned out reasonably well in my humble opinion. This image was taken around 11 a.m. at Capitol Reef National Park. Overall, I think the image has some decent color and I do like it. However, you can see that the areas of the tree trunk that are in shadow are absolutely black and contain no detail. So they probably fall within zones 0 to 2. This image is arguably the worst of the lot, but it is great at showing Velvia's limited dynamic range. The tiny area of sky is well exposed with good color, but many of the areas in shadow go a little dark for my taste. Not only that, the image is actually not focused properly and the composition needs some adjusting. Needless to say, it's just not my best work. This image I actually like, but I wish there was a little more detail in the trees and in the foreground brush below the mountain range. I think the sky and mountains look pretty good for this image. Overall, this image of the Grand Canyon is a pretty good image, but you can see that by exposing for zone 5, the mountains in the bottom right hand corner lose detail because there was insufficient light being reflected into that area that would accommodate Velvia's dynamic range. The good news is that when I crop this image down, it ends up being a pretty decent image and very usable, in my humble opinion. This second image of the Grand Canyon is usable as well, but it once again demonstrates the limited dynamic range of Velvia. A graduated neutral density filter of one to two stops would probably be sufficient to pull that detail out of the foreground. This last image of the New York, New York Hotel Casino was taken at about 10 p.m. Knowing what I know now about Velvia, it's pretty impressive that the film captured quite a bit of detail in the shadowed areas of the building without losing too much detail in the lighted areas. If I were to do this shot over today, I would definitely take it during the blue hour so that the sky would have a nice blue color to it. Despite the narrow 5-stop dynamic range of Fujifilm Velvia, there are a variety of lighting conditions where it will perform quite well. During the 5-10 to 10 minutes prior to sunrise, Velvia can burst with color as in this sunrise shot. Although faint to the human eye, the initial rays of light are recorded nicely on Velvia because of the innate film contrast. The image on the left was taken during light cloud activity, while the image on the right was taken during cloudier conditions, with a small opening in the clouds to allow light to peek through. Velvia 100 tends to give a purple-blue color cast under these conditions, which I think contrasts and balances the sunlight in this particular image. Capturing rainbows with a large format camera isn't the easiest task to complete, but when you do, the results can be quite spectacular. 
Given that storm clouds and sunlight are necessary components to creating rainbows, this often creates a high contrast scene that will push the five stop limit of the film. Most of the scenes with rainbows that I have been able to successfully capture on film were within about 15 to 20 minutes of sunrise and sunset. As the morning moves on, if there are good clouds in the sky, you can get a really nice soft color palette just as you see in this scene during the so-called golden hour. Just after a fresh snowfall and as the storm clears, the sky can take on a really amazing blue color as in this scene. I typically don't shoot velvia around the hours of noon, but there are instances where that can actually be beneficial. These images of the wave were taken at approximately 1 p.m. in the afternoon so that I could minimize the effect of shadows on the interesting colorful lines within the layers of rock. On this particular day, I was extremely fortunate to have some perfectly placed clouds that help retain a more intense blue color in the sky. These two images were taken on a day with very few clouds, and as a result, some of the intense blue sky is lost, which makes the scenes, particularly the one on the right, look flat and less interesting and, of course, less colorful. Once the late afternoon rolls around, the lighting gets ideal again and the color palette becomes soft and rich. Once again, having clouds in the sky helps intensify the colors in the scene. The 15 to 20 minutes just before sunset during the golden hour and in the presence of clouds really brings out the colors that I particularly enjoy. The last rays of light for the day can be quite amazing and imparts nice warmth to a scene. One of the techniques that works great with Velvia around this time is pointing the lens directly at the sun. That chola cactus just glows with intensity. Just as we saw earlier with sunrise, rainbows at sunset can produce very vivid and intense colors. Surprisingly, overcast conditions can produce some interesting and vibrant colors. Scenes that include a sky will typically take on a gray-blue appearance and result in red colors that jump out at you as in the scene on the left. However, I really enjoy overcast conditions for detail work like these colorful starfish. A lightning storm with overcast conditions at sunset can give you some fun results as well. I think what helps this image is that the clouds are not as thick on the right side of the horizon, which allows for some of that sunlight to reflect back into the sky. Shady conditions are similar to overcast conditions, but have the benefit of reflected light. These images have added warmth because of the sunlight that is reflecting back onto the scene. The same goes for this scene. Warm sunlight is bouncing off of the opposite canyon wall and back into the cliff palace. Fog imparts an enigmatic element to a scene that I absolutely love in this image. The colors tend to be on the cooler side, which I think works well for a snow scene. When fog begins to clear, you can get some pretty amazing beams of light, but the scene can turn pretty high in contrast as in these two images. As you can see, the foreground begins to take on a more silhouette-like appearance and you begin to lose some of the detail. Combining natural light with artificial light works really great for the urban scene. These images were both taken within minutes of the sun setting behind the mountains for eye-popping color. Here's another example at sunset and one of my favorites. If you wait for the blue hour, which is just before sunrise or beginning about 10 minutes after sunset, the sky will take on a blue color in photographs just like this image. In the studio, Velvia will pop with color, but you do have to keep in mind the contrast of the film. In this scene, I used the contrast to my advantage to create a moody image. This last slide shows two more studio examples of how great Velvia is for a macro shot of a rose and what happens to skin tone if you photograph people with it. Skin usually will appear more pink or red. This could easily be corrected with a color chart or in image editing software. So the very first thing that I do when I'm trying to determine exposure is measure the latitude of light to see if it falls within the five stops of light that Fujifilm Velvia has. So what I'm going to do first is make sure that my ISO is set correctly. So I'm just going to use ISO 50 for demonstration purposes here. And I'm going to look at the scene, determine where I want detail in the shadow area. So I'm going to take a look at my cactus and I get 1 15th of a second at 8.0. I'm going to lock that number into memory. Then I want detail in the clouds, so I'm going to take a look at what the spot meter says for the clouds. I'm going to lock that value into memory, which was 1 250th of a second at 8.0. 
Now I can look at the screen and it will show me using little indicators what the stop difference is in light between the shadow areas and the light areas. And for this scene, it seems that Fujifilm Velvia will be appropriate. So once I've locked in my exposures, one for the shadow area, so that being one fifteenth of a second, and one for the highlight areas, one two fifty of a second, both at 8.0, I now have two numbers locked into memory. So what that allows me to do is check what the stops of light are going to be for this particular scene. So in this case, I've got five stops of light for this scene, which just squeezes into Fujifilm Velvia's five stops of light. But now what I need to do is calculate the zone 5 average of the scene. And to do that, I simply just press the average button, and I now have one sixtieth of a second displayed on the screen here and also another indicator uh, bar at the bottom of the screen that tells me that this is the average or zone 5 for this particular scene. So the meter has now averaged out the scene such that if I shoot at one sixtieth of, of a second I should get detail in some of the shadow areas as well as the highlight areas by using this particular shutter speed and aperture combination. One of the nice things that this meter does is once I've got my average for the scene is that I now can rotate the dial and select other apertures that I might be interested in and it will automatically adjust the shutter speed based on the aperture that I choose. Once I've determined the average meter reading, or zone 5, the final step that I like to do is scan the scene for exposure values as confirmation of the correct exposure. I do this by holding down the exposure button while I pan the scene and watch the values on the meter display to ensure that the scene fits within plus 2 and minus 2 stops or exposure values. That would correspond with Fujifilm Velvia's 5 stop range. If my exposure values fall outside of this range, I'll determine whether or not I can use a graduated neutral density filter to reduce the light in the sky and bring the scene back to within Velvia's limits. When the scene is in shade like we have right now, the sun has set just behind the mountain, so there's even lighting across this the Chola cactus. So all I'm going to do, it couldn't be any simpler, is pull out the incident meter, make sure that the dial is set correctly so that you are reading the incident meter and not the spot meter. And you simply point the globe back at the camera lens, get your reading, take a look at what you get, one eighth of a second at 8.0 for at an ISO of 50. So that would be the reading that I would go with if I was doing some detail work with a Chola cactus like this in this kind of lighting. The Fujifilm Technical Bulletin is a great resource for a wealth of product information. It is easily found on the web and downloadable as a PDF. I would highly recommend reading this document carefully. Once exposure becomes long enough, the sensitivity of the film to light slows down from what we would normally expect. In Velvia 50's case, that begins with exposures greater than 1 second with Fujifilm not recommending exposure greater than 32 seconds. So does this mean that we have to purchase the color compensating filters suggested by Fujifilm and not expose the film longer than 32 seconds? With all due respect to Fujifilm, I do not follow these recommendations. I enjoy the vivid colors that can be produced with long exposures. Instead, I simply double my exposure readings for exposures greater than 2 seconds. So if my meter says 3 minutes, I expose the film for 6 minutes. It's not the most scientific method, but it has worked well for me as long as I get my initial exposure dead on at zone 5. If you're looking for a more precise correction, my good friend Ken Rockwell recently published his data correction for Velvia 50 on his website kenrockwell.com. If you are using Velvia 100, Fujifilm does not recommend reciprocity correction for exposures up to 1 minute in length. However, exposures greater than 1 minute may require increased exposure and color compensating filters. Beyond 8 minutes, Fujifilm does not list any corrections. In my experience, Velvia 100 tends to slightly overexpose at its ISO rating of 100, so I typically don't consider reciprocity failure outside of Fujifilm's recommendations. In all honesty, there have been several occasions where I've treated Velvia 100 like Velvia 50, 
and I ended up with overexposed, unusable images. I've gotten some pretty consistent and repeatable results using these techniques. Just remember that the film is progressively slowing down as time goes on, and that time is actually on your side when it comes to Velvia 50, but not necessarily with Velvia 100. Sometimes there are situations where I won't use a zone 5 average of the scene. The prime example is that of the silhouette, as in this image of the mittens at Monument Valley. To meter this scene, I simply took one spot meter reading off of the intense red sky and used that reading to set my aperture and shutter speed. So if you're not looking to capture the entire dynamic range of a scene, you can creatively use light to accent selective elements by allowing some of the shadow areas to go dark or the highlight areas to go white. This is accomplished by simply manipulating where you decide Zone 5 should be. To preserve film, Fujifilm recommends temperatures at or below freezing for long-term storage. For long-term storage of my film, whether it's unexposed film or exposed film, I like to have a dedicated freezer like this one, which I purchased off of a major retailer to store my film in. So let's take a look. Let's see what's in my freezer. On the top shelf here, I've got a box of 4x5 Fujifilm Velvia that has been exposed. And I've labeled the box as exposed Fujifilm so that I know that uh, it's already been exposed. But the other thing that I do is that I will put down the number of pieces of film that are in this box. And the reason why I do that is because since I'm developing my own E6 film, I need to match up the amount of chemistry with the number of pieces of film that I have to make it worthwhile mixing up the 10 liter batches of chemistry that I like to mix up. The other thing I do is I also place all the boxes in a Ziploc baggie just as an added moisture vapor barrier. Now one thing that I'm a big fan of doing is keeping my film loaded in my film holders and then putting them in the freezer. That's right, I keep my film holders in the freezer. Not all of them, but at least a good variety of different types of film so that if I suddenly need to go out and shoot because I see that the, the clouds look like it's going to be a great sunset or there's going to be a great sunrise, I can just grab my film holders, throw them in my backpack, and by the time that I get out uh, at the scene, my film's thawed, ready to shoot, so I don't have to worry about uh, getting the uh, film changing bag out and loading film. Uh, so it just speeds up the process a little bit. Now on the bottom shelf here, I've got a lot of Fujifilm uh, Velvia 100 that has been in my freezer for the last three years or so and that are well past the expiration date. And when I do go use them, they're absolutely fine because they've been kept frozen ever since I got them. So personally speaking, I've never had an issue with any color shifts or any damage of the film by keeping uh, unexposed as well as exposed film in a freezer like this one. It's been a really great tool to have uh, for my photography. When it comes to film storage while I'm out in the field, the only thing that I do is keep my film holders out of direct sunlight. So I'll tuck them underneath the car seats or keep them in my backpack. Thankfully, to date, I haven't had any issues. However, some people do use electronic coolers that then can keep their film nice and cool and safe. According to Fujifilm, ideal conditions for the long-term storage of film include maintaining the ambient temperature and humidity as close as possible to the standards used by art galleries and museums, heat, powerful light sources, and walls subjected to significant environmental temperature fluctuations may result in permanent film changes. For my developed film, I have used a variety of techniques to keep my film safe for the long term. Prior to developing my own E6 film, I simply have just kept the film in the original plastic inserts that came from the laboratory where I got the film developed. And then I placed the film in the boxes where the film originally came in. Recently, I've gone to these inserts to keep my film safe for the long term, and they contain no PVC, that's polyvinyl chloride, so that you don't get the gases that are emitted with PVC over the long term, which are plasticizers and chloride, that then can degrade the quality of your film. This happens to be a company called Printfile that makes these. 
And they come in a variety of different sizes. This happens to be the 120 roll film size. This is kind of nice because uh, I get four strips of roll film here for each one of my panels. So four panels per roll if I'm shooting 6x17. So they fit all on one sheet. With 4x5, you get four 4x5 four images for one page. And then the 8x10, you only get one 8x10 image per package insert. If you decide to shoot Velvia, there are currently two types to choose from, Velvia 50 and Velvia 100. To demonstrate the differences between these films, I shot two rolls of each type of 120 film through my 6x7 roll film holder using my 4x5 Zone 6 view camera. I used hypercolored flowers and a color chart as my subject matter on a rotating platter to keep the scene relatively consistent on all four rolls. The lighting used is natural light, in the shade, and on a partly cloudy day. On the light table, there are some very subtle differences in how each of the films render color. However, once I scan the images with my Epson V700, those differences become even more narrowed. Let's have a closer look at each of these colors individually. Since I had 10 frames on each roll, I also decided to demonstrate what happens to the colors of Velvia as you under and overexpose the scene. The minus one refers to one stop underexposed, the zero is zone five, and the plus one refers to one stop overexposed. As you may have noticed, the colors of Velvia 50 are slightly warmer. In addition, Velvia 100 seems to overexpose by about a third to a half of a stop at its ISO rating of 100. Here is another slide showing these differences with normal and overexposure. To summarize, on a light table the differences between these two films is that colors such as red, orange, and yellow tend to be slightly deeper and more intense with Velvia 50. However, once the images are scanned on a flatbed scanner, the bulk of that difference is ameliorated. Finally, Velvia 100 tends to slightly overexpose at its ISO rating of 100. Personally, I prefer Velvia 50 because I have been using it since I started shooting Velvia, but mostly it is because I feel the most comfortable with it, especially with reciprocity considerations. Interestingly enough, my portfolio on my webpage shows images using both types of Velvia. Can you spot the difference? As of June 2016, Velvia 50 and 100 are available in these film sizes. The most important note is that Velvia 50 in the 4x5 and 8x10 film sizes are currently only available through Japan retailers. I purchased mine off of eBay. Well, I hope you found this video useful, especially to those individuals who are looking to shoot Velvia 50 or Velvia 100, but perhaps were a little hesitant to try because of some of the challenges of shooting the film. So I'm hoping that this was a, a good kickstart guide for you guys to get out there and shoot some film. As always, thanks for watching. videos educational or enjoy watching them for the entertainment value, please consider supporting me so that I can continue to produce new content ad-free. By subscribing to my channel, sharing my videos with your friends, or submitting a monetary donation in the amount of the value you've received by watching my videos, you will help me deliver the quality educational photography content you love. Thanks in advance for your support.